everyone. My name is Jacqueline Brickpile, and I am the editor for EWTN's Church Pop. I am here with Father Charbel. I still don't know how to say your last name <laughs> again. Gorbavac. It's a hard one. Croatian name. Gorbavac. Yeah. Gorbavac. <laughs> Good. And uh, he is in Medjugorje right now. Am I correct? On pilgrimage. Yes. Uh, and we're going to be talking about the Norbertine's new series called After the Upper Room. So, hello, uh, hello, Father Charbel. How are you? Hello, Jacqueline and everybody with uh, EWTN and Church Pop. It is so good to see you. Um, I'm so glad that we were able to do this. We had some technical difficulties yesterday, so I'm happy that we could reschedule. Uh, just a little bit about your order. Could we talk about the Norbertines for a few minutes? Yes. Yeah, so St. Norbert founded the Norbertines in 1121, about 900 years ago. He was German, and he founded his first monastery in France, just north of Paris in the Diocese of Soissons. And Norbertines, charism, is really, we have, we say, five marks of the order. We're very Eucharistic. So we have a great love for the Eucharist, solemn celebration of the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass and the Liturgy of the Hours. We're very Marian. We have a devotion to Our Lady. We consecrate ourselves to Mary. We pray her rosary daily in common at St. Michael's Abbey. We also have a great love for the poor, like St. Norbert was a welcomer of those who were poor. And we work in a very poor area, Los Angeles, called Wilmington, a parish of St. Peter and Paul in Wilmington, and also uh, Mary Star of the Sea in San Pedro, Los Angeles. And so we have St. Norbert's marks our love for the Eucharist, love for Mary, love for the poor, love for ourselves by having manual labor, by fasting, self-discipline. And the fifth component would be community life, living together like Jesus and the apostles. Jesus lived with the apostles for three years when he was doing his public ministry before he was crucified. Okay. Well, that's wonderful. A great way to uh, live a holy life. I'm sure there's a yes. lot of graces that come from that. So which apostles were you covering in the show? Uh, St. Michael's Abbey Development Office asked me to do three apostles. They asked me to do Judas. And I was actually happy that I got Judas because I've been reflecting a lot on Judas and Judases in the world especially with the problems in the church, the various scandals, the misuse of authority and God's grace. And because Jesus warned us in John chapter 6, verse 70, Jesus says, Have I not chosen 12 of you, and one of you is a devil? So he warned us. He advised us. He got us ready. Almost like he's saying, if I had picked 12 men and one was a devil, don't be surprised. Don't be naive if there's a devil in the world, in the church, in your parish, in your home, in your family, where you work, even in yourself. Because the devil is alive. We know he's the adversary. He's Satan. He's against God and God's children. And so Judas, for, for example, is an example to us. Don't blow it. Don't be a Judas. Don't be a wolf. Jesus says, I am sending you like lambs amongst wolves. Be as clever as serpent and as innocent as doves. So again, be aware of wolves. Be aware of Judases that will seek to lead you astray. Be aware of a love of money that Judas got caught up in. Be aware of rejecting God's love. He didn't want a part of the intimacy with Jesus Christ, that great love of the Last Supper. He left in the middle of the Last Supper. And right after the Bible tells us, right after Mary Magdalene anointed Jesus, with that very costly spikenard perfume. He said, why wasn't this given to the poor? We know he wanted to steal it. But there was this beautiful moment when a repentant woman humbled himself. She used her tears to wash Jesus' feet, tears of contrition. She used her hair, which is her glory. A woman's glory is her hair. She used her hair to dry the feet of Jesus. And so that beautiful act of forgiveness, of love that Jesus gave to her and received from her, Judas couldn't handle that love he couldn't handle that beautiful act of humiliation repentance because he didn't repent perfectly saint peter denied jesus three times but he repented with contrition with true sorrow 
and was able to come back to God. And so Judas, in a sense, is an important figure because he warns us, right? Don't do what I did. And we know, I think one of the saddest verses in the Bible is when Jesus says, it was better for Judas to have never been born. Wow, that's yeah. some pretty sad words coming from the Savior, Jesus Christ. So I was asked to talk about Judas and then his replacement, Matthias. And we know that there were two men that were found worthy, prayerful men, and they cast lots to see which one was going to be chosen, and that was Matthias. We don't know too much about Matthias. Pope Benedict wrote a little bit about St. Matthias in one of his uh, audiences as Pope in November, and he says, you know, we know very little about Matthias other than he was a disciple of the Lord, a witness to the resurrection. And we're not even quite sure where he is buried. There's different traditions, whether he was buried in the Holy Land or buried in Syria or other parts of the world. And so Judas and Matthias are the ones that were given to me in the series after the upper room. And the third one was St. James the Greater, the brother of St. John the Evangelist. Okay. And I was very happy I was given St. James because this is the apostle who's buried in Spain, where many people make a pilgrimage to visit his tomb, Santiago de Compostela, the way of St. James. And what happened with, with St. James is Mary bilocated to where he was in Spain. So on January 2nd, in the year of our Lord, 40 A.D., Mary bilocated to where St. James was along the Rio Ebro, the River Ebro in Spain, in a city called Zaragoza. And there she spoke and strengthened in St. James. He was one of the farthest the apostles away from Jerusalem. So Mary appeared to him and said, I would like a basilica built here in my honor for the glory of God, and I will help the Christians here. So she appeared to St. James to strengthen his disciples there in Spain. Then St. James, after establishing that church, that community, returned to Jerusalem. He was martyred in Jerusalem, and his body came back to Spain. And in the ninth century, near Santiago de Compostela, St. James was buried because his remains were lost because of the Moors that invaded Spain. The Muslims who invaded Spain from northern Africa. They were occupying that part of the country, and they hid his body, and it was forgotten. And then a bright light appeared one night over his tomb. Some Christians found his tomb. They recognized the writing on the tomb was St. James. And they interred his body in the city of Santiago de Compostela nearby in Galicia, north, northwestern Spain. Thus, many pilgrims make that pilgrimage to honor the saint. Many go to get exercise to do something spiritual or religious. And many people just go because it's a cool thing to do. There are many reasons. But ultimately, the great patron there is guiding people to his tomb, to the glory of God. Wow, that's beautiful. Thank you. There's, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> so we have a culture that rejects Christianity. And how would you, and that, uh, clearly that happens, um, that's happened all through time because it happened even during the days of the apostles because they were martyred for their faith. That's so right. how would you recommend that we, how can we be inspired to go out and evangelize and tell the, and spread the good news, especially in a culture that rejects that and it publicly rejects that even in the media and yep. just, um, I mean, we see constant persecution in, in our world. Yes, and so just like Jesus sent 12 apostles, he sends us. And that's what the Mass means. The word Mass comes from a Latin word, Misa, which means having been sent. So there is a dismissal right at the end of Mass where the priest says, the Lord be with you with your spirit. Go in peace. The victim has been sent. And so he dismisses us at Mass to go out into the world, even though if it's against Jesus, if the culture is anti-Christ, there's no better time to proclaim the gospel because that means the gospel is even more needed by those that are in the world. Even if the world is against Christ, we are sent with the power of God. The power of the gospel is the power of Jesus Christ. 
to bring salvation, to bring truth, beauty, goodness, to bring grace, to bring peace, to bring joy and hope to hearts that are in need of joy. And there's no better thing than to work for than is than the salvation of souls. Amen. Exactly. So since we, you know, a lot of times whenever Easter is over and Pentecost has happened, we think, oh, well, it's ordinary time. And I guess, you know, the celebration's gone, you know, let's back to ordinary time. How can we carry out Pentecost all year long? Beautiful. How do we carry out Pentecost all year long? Well, Pentecost is the coming of the Holy Spirit. And this is the great gift that God gives us. The love of the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. In John's Gospel, St. John says, I am sending you another advocate with the Father. And that's the Holy Spirit. And so we carry the love of God in us by the sanctifier who is the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the paraclete, the spirit of the Father, the spirit of truth. And then that is God, the love of the Father and the Son is the Holy Spirit. And so we carry love of God in us by faith. Faith is our belief in invisible things. It's a gift from God. So we need to pray for more faith. We need the culture. We need a culture of faith. We need to protect our faith and learn about, study our faith. And we need to share our faith. We have to be ready to explain and defend the faith, Catholic apologetics. Like St. Peter says, giving a reason for the hope within us. Being able to explain who God is and what Jesus Christ did for us and what is the incarnation and what is heaven. And how beautiful it is to be forgiven of our sins. And that's free therapy. Christ paid the cross on the cross. He paid for our salvation with his blood on the cross. He bought us back from evil. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, they believe in the serpent. Eve believed in the serpent. She had faith in the serpent. So we have to have faith in God. We have to walk that same walk that our first parents did, but in the opposite direction. And St. Paul says in his letter to the Hebrews, without faith, it's impossible to please God. So we need to pray for faith, protect our faith, ask for more faith, like Jesus says in the Gospels. He heals people by their faith. Your faith has saved you. Your faith has healed you. And then the blind man, the blind man said, Lord, that I might see, increase my faith. And so we carry the Holy Spirit in us, in earthen vessels, like St. Paul says, we carry that light, that grace, by praying the Holy Spirit and being in a state of grace. The most important thing for a Christian is to be free from mortal, serious, grave sin. Mortal sin is sin that we fulfill with three conditions. We have full knowledge of what we're doing is wrong. We have full consent of our will. We want it. And it has to be serious, grave matter. So, for example, sexual sins are grave matter. If you know what you're doing is wrong... You're designing it with your will, and it's a sexual sin, well, and that's a mortal sin, because you have knowledge, you're consenting to it, and it's grave matter. So you want to go to confession, which is the ordinary way to have that sin forgiven, and maintain a state of grace. Like in soccer, somebody might get a red card. So if somebody gets a red card in soccer, that means they're out of the game. A red card is like mortal sin. You're out of God's game. Grace. The way to get back into the game is through a sacramental confession. Or in an extraordinary way by a perfect act of contrition, being truly sorry for your sins. So carry the Holy Spirit in you by praying, by having faith, by being free of mortal sin, and praying to the Holy Spirit to come inside of you. Pray to Mary, who is a spouse of the Holy Spirit. Pray her rosary. Yes. Yes, her rosary is very powerful. <laughs> so... How can we, speaking of carrying that out and uh, being free from mortal sin, you mentioned five, five stones or five pillars of holiness that we can carry out. Can you just talk a little bit about that and how we can live our life in holiness? Beautiful. Yes, definitely. So the five stones are the five wounds of Jesus Christ. Because St. Peter and Isaiah tell us, by the wounds of Christ you are healed. And when a soldier is wounded, he's weaker. And so the five stones of Christ are the five stones David picked up to combat Goliath. The Bible says he picked up five stones from the river, from the wadi, and he threw one, which represents the one true God. 
The five stones help seal and protect our five senses, our eyes, our sense of taste, touch, our hearing, and our smell. And the five wounds are also the five aspects of the life of the following. The first stone is confession. Like in the image of divine mercy, the white waters of confession, the white waters of cleansing, the white waters of baptism. And so when you wash yourself clean by baptism, by confession, by acts of contrition. Second stone, you fill yourself up with the red rays, which are the Eucharist, the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ, really, truly, substantially present in the most holy Eucharist, cleansing and filling with Christ. The third stones are the scriptures, the very word of God, the Holy Bible, the very parables and teachings of Jesus Christ coming to us by the Bible. And this helps cleanse our memory and imagination. We help helps us think about his teachings. And we should read a little bit of the Bible every day, pray and study the Bible, Catholic apologetics, being able to explain and defend the faith to others who may not understand it or be against it. The fourth stone is praying with the heart, praying with the sacred heart of Jesus and praying with the immaculate and sorrowful heart of Mary and praying her rosary especially, which is a summary of the life of Jesus. The fifth stone is fasting, bodily prayer, denying yourself food, maybe on Wednesdays and Fridays or traditional fast days, and being hungry, experiencing hunger, of course, taking care of your health, but also we should be hungry for the Eucharist. So when you deny yourself food you could have, you are uniting yourself with the Holy Eucharist because it reminds you you're hungry for the bread of life. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, You have no life within you, Jesus says in John 6. For my flesh is true food, my blood is true drink. He eats my flesh and drinks my blood. I'll raise him up on the last day. And so fasting is bodily prayer. It makes us hungry for the Eucharist. When we experience hunger, it should make us more compassionate to our neighbors. It should make us a little mindful of those who are going hungry. In fact, two-thirds of the world goes hungry each night. Fasting also buttresses the spiritual life. It makes us stronger. We read in the Gospels, only certain demons are cast out with prayer and fasting. The demons of impurity, of lust, are especially cast out with bodily fasting. And so the five stones are confession, the Holy Eucharist, the Mass, the Holy Bible, the Sacred Scriptures, the Word of God, praying with the heart, the Sacred Heart of Jesus, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, especially the Holy Rosary, talking the God heart, the heart. And the fifth stone against our Goliath is fasting, bodily prayer. That's amazing. Yes, I totally agree. Because without the rosary, without the Eucharist, without confession, you know, even, you know, I am still, I'm still working on the whole fasting thing. But, um, and the scriptures, you just can't reach the level of holiness that without those things. That the level of perfection that helps us to gain salvation. So um, my mother told me once, um, I think it was someone from Medjugorje told her this, that prayer without fasting is like standing on one leg. So yes. um, that's, she always told me that. So Yes. Yeah. Um, but there are people who cannot, uh, I think... There, there are people who can't, the, whenever they see fasting or think about fasting, they think, oh, I have to deprive my body of food all the time. But some people like diabetics can't do that. But they can do other things such as like giving up certain foods that they like or yes. even giving up something else like something that you like, like music or yes. whatever. That counts too, I would think, um, yes, if I'm right. And I, and, and I tell people who are sick or suffering from a disease, you're not really called to bodily fasting. Like you said, you can give other things you like or you can pray more. The important thing is to train the will, to train that faculty to choose good. So the idea is you could have a, like meat on Wednesdays and Fridays, but you say no to meat you could have, which helps train you to say no to things you shouldn't have, like sin, temptation, impurity, pornography, Anger, unforgiveness, rage, the seven capital sins, sloth, envy, anger, lust, but the avarice and pride. So the important thing is training our will to love the good and to reject evil. Yes, that um, 
And I feel like it just gives so much more grace and strength that the Holy Spirit and the Lord just strengthens our will, like you said. So how would you encourage the faithful to, whenever we feel rejection, there's a lot of people, I mean, everyone feels like they're rejected in some way or rejected for their faith. And then there's the world that tells us that the faith is weird or not accepted. So, and that can be really discouraging. So how can yes. we, how, how can we, how would you discourage, I mean, encourage people who feel discouraged in yes. carrying out their faith because of the world's discouragement? Beautiful. By encouraging people who are discouraged or sad, I would say, look to Jesus. Because he reminds us we have no lasting city here. Our true home is in heaven. So it's important to have a certain vision, a certain understanding of the world that we're, we are just traveling through here. We have a certain amount of time and we have a plan. God has a plan for us. He has a purpose for our life. And when we get discouraged, it's important to be mindful of, well, the apostles got discouraged. And so it's important for us to pray for courage. When you experience a vice, or something negative, you need to pray for the opposite virtues. For example, if you experience sadness, you need to pray for joy. If you experience despair or discouragement, you need to pray for hope. If you're experiencing hatred, you need to pray for love. If you're experiencing um, a discouragement or a great darkness, you need to pray for light. You need to ask Jesus. And I love to tell people, here's a secret, the quickest, the fastest, the best way to Jesus to his holy face, to the baby Jesus, through the merciful Jesus, is through his mother. And so ask Jesus through his mother, ask his mother to teach you to pray, to forgive, to receive the Eucharist, to not be discouraged, to be like the apostles who were actually encouraged when they were tried for their faith. Because there's a great grace given to us when we experience controversy we experience opposition to the faith and that's a blessing because we're, we're serving jesus it's a blessing it's a joy to fight for the king of the universe to be his soldier to be his athlete to be his son or daughter it's a blessing to be a christian to carry his name and to carry his grace in earth and dust which are our body to a world in darkness which is a world that wants death and destruction a world that wants despair and and anxiety and nervousness and discouragement there's no better time to be a Christian than now and go to your mother. When children are in trouble, a mother goes to her child and Mary's coming to us. She comes to us, especially when we go to mass because she's more present at mass and for longer than any other place she appeared, whether it's St. James and Zaragoza, when she bilocated to him in 40 AD, when she appeared to countless souls in Guadalupe, in Fatima, in Lourdes, and I believe in Medjugorje, and in Garabandal, Spain and to St. Catherine Labre in Paris with the Miraculous Medal. Mary is more present and longer at Holy Mass than any other place. So go to Mass. Go to Confession. Love the Scriptures. Pray the Rosary. Talk to God heart to heart. And fast. And train in the ways of Christ. Put on, St. Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, put on the shield of faith. Take up the sword of the Spirit. Put on the helmet of hope. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. Make sure you're girded with justice and make sure you're walking in the ways of the gospel. And so these are the ways to fight discouragement and anxiety. The devil loves it when we get discouraged and anxious and we want to give up hope. That's a very dangerous place to be. So that's where we need Mary and her angels all the more, especially St. Michael, the archangel. And you had mentioned too yesterday that we need to be praying for our priests. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yes, we need to pray for our shepherds, our priests, those that give us the Eucharist and confession. With, without a priest, there's no confession. Without a priest, there's no mass. The devil knows this, so he attacks priests especially. And that's part of the reason why we're seeing many priests, cardinals, and bishops fall away from the true calling of Christ. And so it's important to pray and to fast for your priests, to encourage them, not to judge them or criticize them. Christ will judge and criticize them because they hold the place of Christ. This is why the communists all over the world, here in Croatia, in China, 
in Europe, especially Eastern Europe, the communists would attack Greece. In fact, St. John Paul II said when he was in Krakow as the Bishop of Krakow, there was a KGB communist agent assigned to every single priest and seminarian to have a file to watch them, to record them, to see if they could be bribed, to see if there's a scandal in their life, to see maybe what kind of alcohol, if they like to smoke, or how can they be bribed, how can they, they get a hold of them. And there are even people, a few number, there are even people that the communists have sent into seminaries to be ordained to bring about a, a fall of the church within. And you can listen to the testimony of Bella Dodge. She gives a testimony where she was a communist. She helped over 1,100 communists be ordained priests in order to destroy the church from within. So we shouldn't be surprised of the attack from within the church, from without the church. Now, of course, we assume every priest is a validly ordained priest. We pray for them. So what I'm getting at is pray for your shepherds that give you confession, that give you the Eucharist. In Mexico, 1926, 1927, General Calles outlawed the Catholic faith, and he was killing priests and sisters and Catholics, and churches were shut down. Priests had to go into hiding. And so... That may happen in our time also with the great persecution of the church. That might happen. It might not happen. So pray for your priests. Pray and fast for them. They give you the Eucharist. They give you confession. We owe them a great deal. In fact, I'm going to close with this about the priests. St. Alphonse Liguri says in his book, The Dignities and the Duties of the Priests. He says, the dignity of a priest is above the angels because an angel can defend you from a devil but he can't give you the Eucharist or confession. He continues and says the dignity of the priest is above the Blessed Virgin Mary because she was not a priest. She gave birth to Christ once in Bethlehem, but a priest gives us birth, gives birth to Christ at every Holy Mass. And so even here in Medjugorje, when there's an apparition, so say when Mary blesses items, she always says, make sure your priest bless them because she recognizes the power of the ministerial priesthood, which is even a sense above her. Now, it's not to say a priest is holier than Mary, no, but the dignity of the sacerdotal priest, the ministerial priesthood, is above Mary because the priest gives us Jesus at every Mass. And that's pretty beautiful teaching. So if Mary's teaching that, if St. Alphonse Liguri is teaching that, if the Church is teaching that, no wonder the devil is attacking priests. Exactly. That's so true. Thank you for that encouragement for our viewers. Now, how, how can our viewers follow the Norbertines and watch your show? Thank you for that beautiful question. Please go to our website, theabbotcircle.com. Abbotcircle.com, A-B-B-O-T-S, circle.com, is a website we've created a plethora, a wealth of, digital library with videos, podcasts, images, teachings, homilies to share the faith, to communicate the faith in a very modern way. And we have this series after the upper room, four or five minute videos, 14 of them, to talk about the apostles, our best friends, our heroes. And so please go to our website, theabbotcircle.com and go to our main website, stmichaelsabbey.com, S T period, michaelsabbey.com. There you'll find a wealth of information, of information about us. If you like a mass set for your intentions, if you can find out more about our ministries, our vocations, we're blessed with 85 priests and seminarians from one abbey, St. Michael's Abbey, and all the various ways that you can help us and maybe we can help you bring the gospel into your life and to other lives. Thank you so much, Father Charbel. It was so good talking to you. Can you conclude with a blessing for our viewers? Sure. Let me ask you. We can hear the bells here going off. The bells are sacramental. They're blessed. They remind us to pray. And maybe we can pray the Angelus because it's 6 p.m. here. The angel of the Lord declared unto Mary. And she conceived, and she conceived by, by the, the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. 
Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it done unto me according to thy word. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, Pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Pray for us, O Holy Mother of God, that we may be made worthy of the promises of Christ. Let us all pray. Pour forth, we beseech thee, O Lord, thy grace into our hearts, that we, to whom the incarnation of Christ, thy Son, was made known by the message of an angel, May by, by his passion and cross be brought to the glory of his resurrection through the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The session of the Blessed Virgin Mary and all the angels and saints, may God bless you, your loved ones, and all your intentions. In nomini Patris et Fili et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. Amen. Go in Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thank you so much, everybody there at Church Pop. Keep up the great work. Your ministry is vital to many souls. And to all those listeners, here in my prayer, especially at Mass. And may Jesus and Mary bless and guide you all the days of your life. I shall see you all in the Holy Eucharist. God bless from St. Michael's Abbey of the Norbertine Fathers. I'm Father Charbel. See you in the Holy Eucharist. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Ciao, ciao.